I mean, his views on defence policy hark back to the more extreme elements of the Labour Party of the 60s and 70s and 80s. His views on nationalisation were born in another century <laughs> under Karl Marx and were tried extensively in this country and were a lamentable failure. Um, and, and his whole approach to society, I think, is to sort of create an image of society which, in practical terms, doesn't work, you know. Still, there has been something of a sea change. Some of those ideas, you know, that, that, that underpin the kind of the neoliberal revolution of the past few years, the free markets, uh, the idea of deregulation, privatisation, People are coming round to a different way of thinking on every one of those. Well, you say people. There are some people. I spend a lot of my time with, with Labour councillors, Labour leaders in the real world, and they are in dismay about the prospect of a Corbyn-led Labour Party. So, of course, you're quite right to point out to an element of the Corbyn phenomenon. It has achieved a, sort, a certain sort of vision for a certain sort of generation. But I think you have to ask why. What is the background that has created this hunger for change? And when you analyse that, I find it common across the Western world in the post-2008 crash. It's produced an extremism on the right, looking for very simple and very rather unattractive solutions to try and persuade people that there is something that's going to change the frustrations of their life, the frozen living standards, the uh, job losses that have characterized a lot of the last decade. Um, and the nationalism the, the, the suspicion of foreigner, the immigration issues, they all bubble up in circumstances of this sort. Now, of course, you do get an alternative, the other end, the visionary, you nationalise everything type approach. But the real issues that are undermining the stability of governments recently, I think, are much more to do with those basic political issues of uncertainty and fear and uh, the immigration issue, which is all part of it, the, the job insecurity. These are the issues and the frozen living standards, particularly since 2008. Still, I, I remember Theresa May making her first speech on the doorstep of number 10, before even crossing the threshold properly, uh, saying that now was the time to, to look again at the kind of the free market. Now is the time to look at the corporate excesses that have brought so much pain uh, to so many people. And then she did pretty much nothing about it. Indeed, you know, we have her at the Bank of England uh, not making the, making the case for capitalism, uh, not making the case for reform of capitalism. Well, personally, uh, I've always taken great pride in the fact that some of the great reforms of the free market have been led by Conservative administrations. I mean, it was the Conservatives who took the uh, women um, out of the mines and the children out of the chimneys in the 19th century. It was Disraeli who gave the working men the vote. It was Neville Chamberlain associated with great public sector reforms. And if you look at modern society, it is driven in the main by a partnership between the public sector and the capitalist system, but in a regulated climate. I mean, regulations, the interference of government to insist on standards, is actually the hallmark of civilization. But we, we do not live in a jungle economy. Indeed, but at the same time, I mean, look at, look at young people who, frankly, are, are deserting the Conservative cause in droves, and many of them w who would not have countenanced voting for the Conservatives, you know, a few years ago, could never see themselves voting for them. The reason being, well, they find it difficult to get a job. When they do have a job, it's not paying them what they feel that they should be earning. And even when they do get a job that pays them a decent amount of money, they're finding it so incredibly difficult to get onto the housing ladder. We hear Theresa May talking about, you know, the social contract that every generation should experience better conditions. I mean, in terms of the Conservative performance since 2010, I mean, the social contract's been broken, hasn't it? Well, you see, I think that there are different causes affecting the young. It's a lack of vision. And it's very difficult to see how, in the context of Brexit, you produce a vision. And uh, what, what every government has got to do is to have an effective programme. It has to have a vision as to the journey, purpose, where it's going to be, and then it has to have unity. 
Now, in the conference which is about to take place, what we're going to see in practice is a sort of fully dressed but totally revealing political beauty context in which the contenders will be all out there strutting their stuff. And that is the worst sort of background for a government that ought to be concentrating, first of all, on its programme for government, and secondly, on the vision as to where it should go. Now, the vision is bound to include harnessing the forces of enterprise, much better word, if I may say so, than capitalist, the forces of enterprise in order to serve the wider causes of public. Now, I didn't, of course, want to discuss the Conservative leadership political programmes on Sunday. You never delve into this topic. You dragged me on to it. Boris Johnson, you know, there is a man with a vision. We've heard plenty about it twice now for Brexit. What on earth is he up to? Well, he's just, uh, <laughs> we all know what he's up to. He's making sure that his present position as the most favourite uh, to succeed Theresa May is maintained. Uh, it is um, a campaign. It's, I mean, it's always happened. It's what uh, politics, competition is all about. And Boris is, at the, is a master of it. The, whether he'll win or not is another matter altogether, but we all know what he's doing. Master of it? Well, that's the point. I mean, he's had huge amounts of criticism from even some you know, right-leaning newspapers on these two separate occasions on which he's uh, decided to intervene. OK, in your mind... I mean, given the problems that we've been discussing about where the Conservative Party is right now, where the party is as regards young people, I mean, is Boris Johnson the man to sort out? Well, I, personally, his views on Brexit are quite unacceptable. Uh, I understand who he's appealing to. He's appealing to uh, an elderly part of the, of the uh, uh, society, uh, many of them members of the Conservative Party, and uh, he is appealing to those elements of their personal conviction that he thinks are most likely to trigger support for him. Uh, and I understand those arguments, but they're phony. They're duplicitous. They bear no relationship. Look at Bombardier, what's going on there. That's the real world of international trade, as anybody who spent any time in the export market fully understands. And so talking about a sort of world hungry for new British exporters to suddenly come over the horizon uh, is just talking about something that doesn't exist. I mean, you yourself have, have, have a degree of form when it comes to intransigence and uh, an insurrection within the Conservative Party. Actually, you know, squint your eyes, former MP for Henley, you know, occasionally unruly mop of hair, ability to annoy female Conservative Prime Ministers. I mean, do you think Boris Johnson is in any way emulating what you got up to? Well, I, I think that uh, you have to uh, redraw the character. I was the person that Margaret Thatcher relied on time and time again to carry through conservative policies. The right to buy, self-evidently, the battle against CND, the reduction in the size of the public sector in the various departmental activities, the work I did on the inner cities, all of this with the support of Margaret Thatcher. It was only on a specific issue that uh, we clashed. And you resigned? I so did resign. Theresa May sack Boris Johnson? Well, I resigned. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to, for Boris to go on making the sort of interventions that he is and remain within the government. What yeah, so, the, so, so, so should Theresa May replace him? Well, I, I think that the case for sacking Boris is, is very strong, except in one crucial way, that uh, the danger of doing it in the fragmentation of Parliament today is perhaps a bigger risk. And so leaving him there until he completely oversteps the mark is a wise thing to do. Whether it is right, in most circumstances it would be wrong. In these circumstances it might be the only option. It strikes me that there are two, two separate issues here. One, whether or not Boris Johnson you know, has, has the ability to, to, to take over the, the leadership of the Conservative Party. The second question follows on from that. If he has, is he the right man to beat Jeremy Corbyn at the next general election, whenever that might be? Well, my own guess, the election will be in a couple of years' time. And I think that the Conservatives are going to be lumbered with the failures of Brexit. 
I, I, I see no way in which the Conservatives can actually transform the performance of the economy in the two years from now to the next election. So who should, who should be the next leader of the well, Conservative Party, given that time scale? My view is quite clear. At the moment, I haven't seen somebody who's prepared to recognise that the song has to be changed, not just the singer. Interestingly enough, Ruth Davidson, in the first break I've seen from the counter-Brexit side of the argument today, has begun to qualify the sort of position. But, but this whole thing is, in, is, is unsustainable. You cannot have a government in which various members of the cabinet are vo voicing opinions which are not consistent one with the other. I mean, you say it's unsustainable, but at what point does Theresa May either feel that she no longer has the authority to carry on or the, the, the election process is, is set in motion? Well, I don't think it'll be her decision. It, the point, you, you ask the right question, is the point at which the parliamentary party said we've had enough. Mm. In terms of Brexit, do you think that the party will, will ultimately see this process through? Well, I hope not. And uh, I have, there are grounds for believing it's possible. Not likely. At the moment, it looks as though Brexit is likely to happen. But for my money, events will intervene, public opinion will change, and uh, the party will realise that as Labour will actually become increasingly anti-Brexit, the Tories are going to be left lumbered with the responsibility for this thing. But do you ever, do you ever find it quite lonely being in this position? I mean, as things stand, I mean, it's, there's not a single MP in, in any party at the moment who, who appears to agree with you. It's yourself, it's Tony Blair, to an extent it's, it's Vince Cable. Do you feel like you're on the, the right side of the argument given the, the weight of opinion against you, you know, in the House of Commons? Well, I know what a lot of those members think. They may not say it, and I understand why they don't say it, because politics is about tribes, and there are great penalties to pay for appearing to differ from your tribe. But I'm not interested in any of those penalties. My question is, am I right? And uh, I parade in support of myself every Conservative leader since Winston Churchill all of whom believed that Britain's self-interest, Britain's self-interest, was inextricably interwoven with Europe. I believe it today, and uh, I know large numbers of MPs do believe it too. Where is the, the voice who will change the song? You've been working for the party uh, since the 1950s. How much difficulty, how much trouble is the Conservative Party in right now? I think it is in serious risk of not winning the next election. If it goes on as it is now, uh, I'm appalled. I, I, I find it almost incredible, having been in the House of Commons with Jeremy Corbyn for all those years, so knowing something of his views and something of the Labour's views, I find it almost incredible to hear myself saying it. But analysing the way things are going, looking at the opinion polls, anticipating, the anticipating events as I think they'll unfold, it is now a very serious risk. Lord Heseltine, many thanks for being with us. Thank you.